Right, sit down. So there I am. There, but, but, see my and everything. Okay, so so for the Computer Conservation Society, everyone can see the screen. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I focus. Uh, I, I'm, in this talk, I'm going to focus a bit more on a slightly narrower story, um, and it's one that I've written about a bit on my blog. So if you're if you're curious about it, you can go and look at that. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave in a few of these other threads around. So in in other words, this is a bit of a rag bag of a talk with a moral pack on the end. So we'll see how we get on with that. Okay, so um, as we heard, the baby um, was recreated 25 years ago now. And this was a machine uh, that was profoundly worth recreating. And it's a bit of an honor, I think we've got Chris Burton on the call uh, uh, today. So a, real, um, a really important marking of Manchester's place in the 20th century. Uh, and the reason for that was because it was on the original of this machine in uh, in um, carry on, carry yeah, on. yeah, I'm trying my best. Um, it was on the original of this machine um, uh, 75 years ago next month. Uh, that what it, it, in the world of computer in any historical first, the first anything is pretty hard to agree. First computer is not really a means to be, but it, it, the world's first program could reasonably be said to run on this machine um, 75 years ago. That's an extraordinary thing when you think how profoundly uh, programs and software um, uh, run uh, are at the heart of our world today. So that's an extraordinary thing. And the building that that uh, event happened in is, uh, I don't know, uh, 500 meters south from where I'm sitting now uh, on Cookman Street. And if you walk down to that building, you'll see two blue plaques whose existence on that building really go back to that event. And one of those plaques on the left is to Alan Matheson Turing, who everyone in this room has heard of, and in, in every room I give these talks to has heard of. And, and the plaque says, a creative computer science code breaker mathematician. And there's another blue plaque on it who everyone in this room has heard of, but I'm afraid to tell you no other room I ever go in, uh, which is Frederick Williams and Tom Kilburn, creators of the first stored program computer. Now, these two blue plaques, rather brilliantly for my storytelling today, they face in different directions. One of them faces north. Frederick Williams and Tom Kilburn plaque faces north. The Turing plaque faces south. You cannot see both these plaques at the same time. They are both about the same world historical event, and neither of them refer to each other. There are two stories here, and why don't they tell, why, why don't they talk about it, that, that? And that's what I'm going to try and explore a little bit by telling you those two different stories, some of which many of you will be profoundly familiar with, or some of you will be, be all familiar with. So let's start with the what you might call the engineer's story, Williams and Kilburn. Um, uh, and uh, Williams uh, was an engineering graduate. Interestingly, Tom Kilburn was a maths graduate. Um, uh, uh, and they built in Manchester this machine. Now, Manchester, why Manchester? Well, because Manchester was the industrial heartland of Britain. So during the, 19, during the 19th century, obviously cotton, and then the industrial infrastructure that supported the industrialization of cotton, steam, uh, and then by the early part of the 20th century, electricity. So at Trafford Park, uh, oh, actually, so at Trafford Park, for instance, you've got Westinghouse, uh, out at Moston, you've got Ferranti building consumer electronics. Uh, the new electric 20th century is happening in Manchester. And um, for that reason, a relatively young, but already recognized as brilliant uh, professor called Professor Blackett, uh, but at this stage, he's a professor in London, um, uh, a rather handsome and patrician young man, comes to Manchester in 1934 to solve the riddle of space right, in some kind of Marie Kondo way. Um, but what he's trying to, what, what Patrick Blackett was interested in and got a Nobel Prize for was uh, detecting cosmic rays. So to do that, uh, he needed a big magnet. To do that, he went out to Trafford Park and got them to build a big magnet for him. Everybody did the normal kind of science PR you do when you do that kind of project. So Manchester is a place where uh, uh, scientists 
academic scientists go to for engineering technology uh, in a mutually beneficial way. Um, and during the Second World War, the uh, uh, factory, can people see me if I wiggle that on the, no, you can't. Right, so the factory, which is on the left on, on the screen, uh, was out in Trafford Park. And during the Second World War, the, that factory was turned over to the production of Lancaster bombers. It turned out a thousand bombers during the course of, of the Second World War. Um, and Metropolitan Vickers were very positive about the post-war future. And that was something that slightly surprised me. Uh, one of the reasons I wrote the book was I came to Manchester uh, around, 20, uh, around, uh, around 20 years ago. Uh, and I thought, I imagined that post-war Manchester was a rather grim place. Uh, and in some ways, of course, it was, and Manchester shared in the privations and terrors of the rest of the country. But actually, it was a place that made a lot of money uh, and a lot of employment and had a great deal of technical innovation out of the war. And so reconstruction was something that people were positive and uh, optimistic about. And one of the great innovations, particularly of British electronics during the Second World War, was that they won the race for effective radar. Um, uh, so those, those thousands of Lancaster bombers had to be equipped with radar sets or, the or um, wherever the radar sets went. And this is a lovely lithograph that's in Manchester um, Art Gallery by Ethel Gabane of a, a female worker um, uh, making one of these cathode ray tubes that was used as part of the radar set infrastructure. Uh, so, you, And this is in the Ferranti factory in Moston, which got turned over from domestic consumer electronics it emerged electric, the emerging consumer electric into this emerging defense electronics. So after the Second World War, Manchester is a place with electronics um, technology. But that's not just electronics technology. Manchester was also a center of numerical computing. This is a, um, the, uh, a model. Does anyone know where this object is? It is it's from the history of computing. It is uh, a model of a heart tree different of a differential analyzer, which was an analog uh, computer used computing to do thing to do calculation, and it's a model that was built by the, the Manchester professor of mathematics, with Douglas Hartree, to persuade the university senate to give him the money to build one, uh, and they said no. But he built it out of Meccano. Um, and they said no, uh, but he found a, a local donor who was a big um, heir to a, a flower industry who said, yes, I'll give you the money. And for that reason, Manchester had actually, uh, going into the Second World War, became the nation's centre for numerical computation. So uh, there was, there was a, a, the emerging atom bomb project, for instance, sent pro projects to Manchester to be solved in the basement of the physics laboratory, which was by, by that stage being run by Patrick Blackett, that handsome patrician who had come to Manchester uh, to the war. So this is history of computing. The reason I mentioned after you, you know where this is, is that this piece of Manchester heritage is in the Science Museum in London. So, you know, uh, that I, I think absolutely I, it is time for the LB marbles to go back, but we should have this back too. Yeah. So, okay. You're thinking of a bit of a scab in that. Yeah. Okay, so um, Manchester then is a, a center for technology and it's a place that people come to for opportunity and um, uh, ex new careers, as I reckon some of the people in this room probably have done, I certainly. And one of the things I was curious about, and I'm just gonna stay over this, is, is what was the city they came to like? And in every single account of a read of people coming to Manchester in that post period, the first thing people talked about was how filthy it was. How black it was. It was amazingly black. It was amazingly black. And it's actually surprisingly hard to find documentary evidence of it. I, I'm, as you said, I'm a mathematician by background, not a historian. And I had this slightly naive idea that the past was in black and white. And it, so, so I was very pleased when I could discover color photographs. This is from the 1960s. You can still see panels. It's absolutely black, this look. But that wasn't read in the same way as we read it, we would read it today. If you saw a civic building like that today, you would say that was neglect. It wasn't a looked after building that people were proud of. But to all these immigrants, uh, uh, and Turing and um, Kilburn, uh, uh, were, were, were too, this was a sign, blackness was a sign of economic wealth. It was a sign of progress. This is the black from the soot that powers industry and warms the homes and provides the jobs. 
So Manchester is an attractive place to come to, even if not physically. And Freddie Williams, one of those blue packs, was one of the people attracted after the war. Now, why did he come to Manchester? Well, uh, he wasn't to be a mathematician. I was and never will be a mathematician. I did not know there was any system of num numbers other than the scale of 10. But when the specification of a storage system was explained to me, I could grasp what was wanted. And he actually mentions that even before he came to Manchester, uh, he'd worked out a storage device for storing uh, a bit. And that's why Williams came to Manchester. He was recruited in order to build what became not the world's first computer program. That's actually a relatively minor um, milestone. The real thing that really happened in that room with the baby was the world's first working computer memory. Right? The competitive devices, which radar at that time is needing storage devices because we need to work out where the radar blips have been before. Um, uh, and they were using delay lines where you, like full of mercury, you sent in a bash at one end, waited for it to come out to the other. Very difficult, slow. Alan Turing suggested you should use gin instead because the liquid had better properties or something like that. But, but it was really hard to work. And there are two moments of genius, I think, in this story. And this is one of them. So Freddie Williams noticed something odd. I still don't really understand it about the electromagnetism, what happens when uh, the, the electron in a cathode ray tube hits the phosphor screen and explodes and you get this pulse and he worked out how to capture that and send it back in the back of the cathode ray tube in a way that you've got this recurrent cycle that is a memory. One bit on a screen. And that's what he uh, was recruited specifically to Manchester to do. And as he said, Tom Kilburn and I knew nothing about computers. Professor Newman, who you'll see in a minute, and Mr. Alan Turing knew a lot about computers. They took us by the hand and explained how numbers could live with houses in addresses. So this insight that machines could do processing, rather than just adding stuff up, comes from the mathematicians. But it doesn't build a machine. And from that moment of sheer engineering genius came a lot of engineering, very hard work. And particularly, I, I think, let's say, really Tom Kilburn's drive, um, assembling the engineering of this, um, created what became the baby. And uh, I'm quite proud of this quote because I actually found it in the research for my next biography, uh, which I'm not in a position to tell you yet, but uh, in early. Um, uh, this is a, a quote at the bottom from, a, a, if you're in that world, a famous uh, American cybernetician called Warren McCulloch. He was one of the first people to think about how physical human brains might actually have neural network networks, uh, the kind of neural network technology that goes into ChatGPT today. Um, and he, he visited Manchester in 1949 and he said, I spent a day with Turing and Jones going to the lecture in the math department, not one of the engineers in Manchester. They use a tube that looks like a cathode ray in which they write the things to be remembered as so many jots or places for jots. Let's call them tittles arranged in columns and rows. So a couple of things here. First of all, Warren Culloch, um uh, was a bit of a poet and uh, the subject of my biography he was a bit in love with and she was a bit of a poet as well. And he, he, this is a quote that he wrote to her. Uh, and had history been just a little bit differ different and she'd become a, an advocate for, for cybernetics and computing, we might be talking about these, these new words. Nobody had a good word for what these dots were. We now naturally call them bits, but it wasn't a fixed technolo terminology at the time. So we're only one poet away from uh, measuring the size of your USB stick in gigapixels. It was an arbitrary word. But the other point I want to make about this is when he, when this guy came to Manchester in 1949, a year after that uh, that first program ran, he went to see the mathematicians, not the engineers. He was interested in the use of this machine, and he was it was shown to them by the mathematicians. And the reason that happened was because there was a building. Uh, this building didn't exist in 1949, but it was going up soon after. This is a floor plan of the building that's got those plaques on down in Coopman Street. And um, I'm going to go up here. There's a room for Mr. Turing, the same size room for Mr. Kilburn. So the vision of the service that the University of Manchester was going to create was it's going to have an engineer in Kilburn 
<laughs> and it was going to have uh, something in Turing. And the something was going to be a software person, right? But nobody had the words for that then. That was, that was the role. So things progress. That, um, that brilliantly successful prototype is shown off to lots of visiting dignitaries over the next few years. Um, uh, there's this extraordinary contract drawn up with Ferranti to commercialize the next um, uh, iteration. And by the early 1950s, the, what's become the Ferranti Mark I is clad in this uh, uh, rather you know, aerodynamic, modernistic metal. And it's got the Ferranti sales engineers. And I think that's Tom Tilden leaning over the, the, the middle. So, and this becomes the world's first, again, uh, commercial computer sale. Uh, so this is a very successful story and it's a story that there's a great deal of credit in uh, and a fair bit to go around. And I've just put this in because uh, the colour picture of, my, of the Toronto Mark 1 um, is quite nice to see. Okay, and that builds uh, an institutional momentum uh, for Williams and Kilburn. Uh, they get a new building. So up at the top of the screen, there's this white H shape. And that was the new electrical engineering building, the very first building that the university built in its post-war reconstruction. Very well, not quite the very first building, because actually the very first building was this little building down here, which was that Coopston Street building, built specifically for their prototype. So very, very scarce resources are being driven into, um, and again, you can see it's white here because it's new, hasn't been covered with Manchester dust yet. Um, very scarce resources are being built, put into this investment, and it pays off. Um, Williams becomes a professor, a big professor, and there's this quite interesting um, talk that he wrote uh, in, in his, uh, his kind of sometimes called just the philippores, when professors sort of don't have to do any work anymore, they're asked to give talks and stuff like that. So an after dinner talk, you get, okay, the engineer is invariably associated with trade. To be really tops, though, in this country, one must be supremely good at something, because something at which one must be supremely good must be absolutely useless. So that, he's not saying that for praise. He's saying uh, the public hasn't set aside their traditional aristocratic attitude. Now, uh, he, uh, he comes across to me as a rather a, a nice and interesting man. I, he's not a bitter man. But there is a sense of class tension here, right? No matter how brilliant I am, no matter how important the computer is, I'm still kind of an engineer. I'm never going to be tops in your cultural system, maybe. And then you've got a slightly different figure, a much younger man, obviously, Tom Kilburn, comes as an assistant, gets a PhD out of, uh, out of working uh, for Williams. And in this thing, I'm not quite sure the date, so early 1960s, whatever, he becomes, in turn, Britain's first professor of computer engineering. And he's got plans for this brilliant new computer, the Atlas, due for completion in 1962, which will act three million times faster than the human brain. So very successful career. And when he's asked about, you know, his career in computing around the time of the baby reconstruction, the 1998 ceremony, what does he say? Well, between 1945 and 1997, somehow or other, I knew what a digital computer was. Where I've got that knowledge from, I've got no idea. And I'm sure he's right. Right, this is 50 years after the event of a, of a career entirely about building computers. Why should he care or be interested in who it was told him about where numbers lived in houses? Who was that? That was Max Newman and Alan Turing. And there's documentary records of Tom Kilburn going to lectures on computer design uh, that Turing put on in the early post-war period. Now, by that stage, Tom Kilburn probably had his own ideas about computer design, and there's some anecdotal, not documentary record of them kind of coming to blows um, over things. But the idea that this was a sort of, um, you know, de novo thing, oh, once we have memory, what will we do with it? We build the computer. It's not a very convincing one. And that goes on, this institutional growth and produces what, what the university now calls the Kilburn building. O opposite that building on Coopman Street, this sort of, uh, Abbey-like building with the monks inside who would tend, you know, an IBM 2966 or whatever it's called. Big, massive computing period. And quite rightly, inside that building, there's an, an awareness of heritage and a celebration of heritage. So if you walk around that building, you'll see a picture. And if you know who these people are, then 
um, and you know who they are. These are the great figures of, according to that institutional memory of Manchester Potwell Computing and some of their technological achievements. 2048 digit store, that's what the babies achieved. And if you look really, really hard, you really do have to look hard. This is a photo I took in 2018 and it's now much easier. This is the only mention I could find of Alan Turing in 2018, apart from one brand new poster they just put up. Uh, but for years, the only memory was, mention of Alan Turing was, at first, programs on the Franti Mark I were written in binary using an ingenious but daunting system devised by Alan Turing, who came to Manchester in October 1948. Which really, really crucially for this story, this story is three months after that first program. Uh, and then this, this base 32 system. So that's not historically inaccurate. Um, well, well, actually, quite who devised the system is actually. So let's think a bit about an alternative story that, and you have to think about it, that alternative story because it's not. Williams and Kilburn's face you see on every single street corner in Manchester, is it? It's Alan Turing. So why do we see Alan Turing everywhere? Why is that blue plaque there? Well, that story starts down in Cambridge. And I, last time I gave a version of this talk to the Geographical Society, I got the speaker to invite me as Jonathan Swinton is a graduate of uh, the same Cambridge College as Alan Turing, which is a factually correct statement. Uh, and it got exactly the correct um, uh, thing I wanted of getting everybody facts up right at the beginning. You know, this southerner come to tell you um, the story of a northern story. Right? And that's one of the things we want to think about when we think about what happens when Turing comes to Manchester. Although, as, as I said, Kilburn was Cambridge first. So, Cambridge in the 1930s, Bloomsbury Group, all that kind of stuff, uh, is a place of pure thought, right? So where pure thought is, nothing is more pure than thought. And no one subscribed to that more than this man, a hero of our story, Max Newman, one of the heroes. Uh, Max Newman um, comes from uh, kind of uh, actually German refugee roots, um, uh, but he's classic uh, sort of Cambridge figure, very, very, very good at uh, maths exams, rises up the ranks, becomes a fellow of St. John's College, Cambridge, very traditional. Cambridge College, and he settled down to the life of a Cambridge Don, teaching the maths that uh, is either traditional or interesting. But he's a bit different to actually all the other Cambridge mathematicians because he's been to Germany. And in the beginning of the 20th century, all of the action in the fundamentals of mathematics is happening in Germany. People like Frege um, uh, and Gödel. Perhaps how did Gödel think of doing? And he comes back from Germany to tell the stories of, of what's now called um, foundations of mathematics. And I'm not going to tell you those stories. If you know them, then you're, 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 you do. And if you're not, then I'm not going to explain it now. Um, uh, but in order to explain one of these problems to his students, uh, he gives a lecture. Uh, in, in the mid 1930s, in a small seminar room in, in St. John's College. And he explains his problem that this German uh, mathematician Hilbert has posed. He said, What are the limits of mathematics? How do we know the problems we can solve with maths and the problems that we can't solve with maths? Now, you may see, think that's an absurd question um, or an unanswerable question um, or, or an uninteresting question. But there was someone in the room who thought it was really interesting, but didn't say anything, filed out at the end of the seminar. Now find a copy of the book. Um, and a year later, a year later, comes back to Max Newman without having said anything in the in the in the intervening period and hands him a sheaf of paper. And that sheaf of paper is a paper now called which is called On Computable Numbers. And it is, of course, Alan Turing has written a paper designed and successfully solving this arbitrary, yeah, arbitrary problem in mathematics about what it is to know when you can solve a problem. And today, not at the time, but today, this paper, I've deliberately put up an incomprehensible bit of it, um, so it's not going to be tough on this bit. Um, today, this paper is now seen as the, the founding text of theoretical computer science. Right? So undergraduates uh, in the high end, uh, or elite, perhaps you could say, uh, computer science degrees will get taught about computability theory uh, and Turing's foundational a thing that's called the Turing machine. And what the Turing machine is, 
the rest of us is a theoretical representation of a computer, an electro modern electron computer. And the reason why that's totally astonishing and the second stroke of genius in this talk is because no one had a, a, an ele a modern electronic general purpose computer. Turing had to invent the concept of it to solve this problem. Right? He didn't invent the concept of it to do adding up quickly. He didn't invent the concept of it to have a chat GPT, he just what did solve this problem. Now, Max Newman was blown away by this uh, paper. He said that single act put Turing in the first rank of applications, he was a really rubbish day to day mathematician, always making mistakes. Um, but Turing, from that point on, was set. He would have had an academic career uh, in King's at Cambridge or in Princeton, where he went for a bit. But then, of course, in 1939, uh, war breaks out. And on the first day of the war, uh, a list that they've already compiled of, as someone said from the Treasury, men of the professor, professor type um, are summoned to Bletchley Park, of whom Turing is one. Newman doesn't go at first. It's not quite clear why. It might have been he thought it was going to be a bit too boring for him. He didn't have a good enough good math. But eventually, Newman goes as well. And the two of them uh, uh, separately run two separate code breaking operations. Um, one of them very famously Im immortalized on film with Keira Knightley, uh, the Enigma uh, um, and the bombs. And uh, Central Ref has got an exhibition on at the moment uh, of the Polish contribution to uh, code breaking, quite interesting, which generously mentions Alan Turing, whereas obviously quite a lot of the Alan Turing references don't mention Poland. But, um, uh, but the other thing that Max Newman was in charge of, a different code, um, required as part of the solution method, the breaking method they came up with, very large numbers of letter counting. You had to go through uh, all of these different uh, messages and count up different combinations of letters. And Newman, al alongside uh, a post office engineer called Tommy Flowers, came up with the design of a machine called the Colossus. And to most computing historians, which I'm not quite, which I'm not really one of, the Colossus, unlike certainly unlike the bomb, is in the line of development of the modern general ele electronic computer. It wasn't one, but lots of the ideas are in there. And the crucial thing, it's of this story at least, was this machine, although it wasn't designed to be, turned out to be reprogrammable. And after they built it, one of the mathematicians thought, oh, if we'd done it that way, then we'd be able to solve this problem five times faster. And so they unplugged it, plugged it in again, and effectively reprogrammed this machine. So that's an extraordinary insight. If you're in the middle of trying to fight a war, that you can reprogram this logical solving thing to get your answer going. And that insight did not stay in Bletchley Park. Who else knows about Bletchley Park? Very, very few people. One of the people who knows is Patrick Luckett. So Patrick Luckett, because he knows about radioactivity, uh, and he's very patrician, and he's a professor. Uh, uh, he's uh, he's one of the few Manchester figures who's down in London all the time during the war, advising on the science war. So he's not on the more committed to the government, but he knows about it. And extraordinarily, he knows about Bletchley Park, which is a top secret. And for what I'm about to say, I have no documentary evidence whatsoever, but I think it's absolutely certain in my mind that as the war finishes and the British government is thinking about uh, positioning its defence spending or infrastructure for a post-war period. Patrick Blackett and Max Newman are saying, we have here a, uh, a machine of war-winning potential. Britain must invest in computing of this type. And that, I think, is why um, the money comes. Um, a huge amount of money is granted by the Royal Society. Um, to post-war Manchester. This is one of the few shots, like uh, this is um, a shot from about where Primark is now in, in, in Manchester across Piccadilly. There was bomb damage, but nevertheless, they rebuilt, they continued. And in that post-war Manchester, that's why Williams was recruited, to, to deliver that memory that was going to be a vital ingredient of the Manchester computer. And there is a suggestion, and I can't really pin this down with how the truth is, that Manchester was going to follow Max Newman's dream of a machine that you could do thinking with. Right? They're going back to that earlier thing about how can we do maths? Well, we can have a computer that will reason that way. And the computer down in Cambridge, there's another project that was also funded, 
uh, was meant for doing fast adding up. You know, lots and lots of calculations initially, um, uh, gunnery calculations, but very quickly uh, atom bomb calculations. That's probably even really right from the beginning. Atom bomb. And the reason we know that Max Newman was at the heart of the Manchester project comes from um, um, a, a thing I found in his diaries in 1948, right? The end of 1948, so after that program has run, he meets um, a guy called, um, uh, I've forgotten, essentially, a guy who is essentially the chief scientific advisor to the Ministry of Defense. So it's Angela McLean, the you know, current um, leaders. Um, uh, the contract now placed, building X, play with Royal Society 35,000 pounds. That's the money the Royal Society gave to build this computer. And crucially, they will find a little steel. Steel is the currency of power in 1948 Britain. All right, the country has no money, no steel. Whatever it has is devoted to crucial pro infrastructure projects. So this is a clear sign that government is supporting the Manchester computer and it's doing it through the mathematician, even as late as 1948. Um, I just want to briefly mention in passing, one of the brilliant document, doc, documentarians of this period was Max Newman's wife. Um, so most of the, most of the players in this story wrote terrible letters. Turing was quite vivid, but Max Newman's are all, you know, coming on the 5.30 train. But his wife was a literary journalist, you know, you know welcome people. And we've got this brilliant archive of her stuff. Um, all the same, the activities of mathematicians are very lofty and disinterested and one, one must have admire the ability to give up one's life to things so appallingly boring. It's understandable when people do it, but when someone with the versatile of mind Max does it, it's very deep, it's very strange. Uh, and the reason she's complaining is because Alan Turing and, Ma and Max Newman are sitting in his back garden in Orchium, her back garden in Orchium, and they're talking about what can you do with this new thinking machine? We can get it to tell jokes. We can get it to write sonnets. We can get it to write love letters. And she finds that very disturbing. And in fact, she's one of the first records we have of lay people thinking, I'm not sure I like the implications of what you think you're going to do with this artificial intelligence. Um, but what they actually did, and they actually did start thinking about artificial intelligence. So this is a thesis um, summary from 1950. And if you know about um, computing computability theory and um, uh, what comes the technology of artificial intelligence land calculus um, this was uh, a woman called Audrey Bates who was Turing's MSc student um, uh, wrote her MSc thesis on this very deep logical re reasoning problem not about fast maths or memories or fast adding up and memory uh, and thanks Turing and Newman and, uh, and Audrey Bates uh, um, goes on to be a real pioneer of computing uh, based on what she learned. This is a, the only good picture I've got from her. This is her uh, in the 80s in Toronto. She went out to be, uh, she, she had quite such expertise in the Manchester computer that um, but the department in Manchester had no space for her whatsoever. Uh, so she ended up going to Toronto where they had a machine and she became their expert. Uh, and even the University of Toronto, 50 years, 40 years afterwards, when they captioned this paper, this photo said um, with teletype operator, right? She's actually there because she's showing the men how to use this uh, thing. This actually was the first remote computing um, uh, demonstration. Anyway, uh, Audrey Bates. So Turing got recruited, as we saw just after um, that program ran in 1948. Uh, what's his job? It's software. That's how we now understand it. And it's thinking, so he's supervising the NSC students, he's thinking about how can we have a computer that um, uh, thinks, but also he writes a software manual. The software manual, famous for being so full of errors that it really taught you very well how to code, because by the time you'd corrected all the errors, you knew how to code. That was, it worked. The pro that all of the problems were so full of, uh, you had to basically work them all out from scratch. Um, uh, but he did write that software, that first software manual, and I'm not really going to talk here, partly because I don't really don't know about exactly what the interaction is between software design and hardware design, both before and after the baby and the Mark One. But what's clear is Kilburn and Turing were meant to operate together, and they really didn't. Right? There's one or two records of them working together, but the truth is Turing was pushed out, or Turing was not used 
by the English department. And that's why it was just, the, it's just memory, he's just remembered as daunting. He's in the marketing. So when Ferranti want to market a computer, they have a picture of not um, the engineer at the side, but Alan Turing is on the right hand side of this picture. It's slightly reflected in the modernity. Why is he there? He's there because the new computers, they've got to be sold. How do you sell these computers? Nobody knows what you can do with them. And the, the truth is, they're a bit useless. I, I doubt that anyone who bought any of these early computers actually, in hindsight, saved money on, on them over other decades. So that's a, that actually might be used to discuss some profits, but um, he's here to market the fact that we've got all these clever things we can do with these computers and the mathematicians are in charge. Just, I'm just going to, um, since it's time's running out, I'm just going to jump a, a, a little bit back to the sort of social history side of um, things to talk about. What did Turing think of Manchester? Well, he said it rained a lot. He said it was dark. He said the, the standard male physique is quite low. Um, but fortunately, he shouldn't have been looking. He had time, when he first moved to Manchester, uh, he had a boyfriend, and he would have friends up to uh, for the weekend. Uh, and he would have friends up for the weekend. He would take them on the Bridgewater Canal, take them to see the um, Barn Aqueduct, you know. So as we all have. Um, uh, just mention some other stories that popped out. This guy on the right, Dietrich Prince. Um, uh, he's a refugee from Nazi Germany, so. The technology you hit the woman on the left, I don't know the name of the current theme here. I'm afraid. Again, he was very interested in using the computer to play games, but as a demonstration of how to market computers and as an intellectual problem, uh, rather than a central meaning. Um, so he's quite an interesting figure. Um, so there's uh, refugees. This is a letter from uh, Turing. Um, Turing's not quite the saint. That you have to be to be a proper martyr. He was a terrible snob. Um, this is from a letter he wrote to a friend uh, about how to a, a book. They were jokingly uh, thinking about writing about uh, how to understand the working classes. He and his friend both spent quite a lot of time staring at rather young working class men. Um, but it, it was a general sort of social response to his, his culture, Cambridge culture. Um, uh, the only problem is we'd have to write on the subject without hurting the poor dude's feelings. Yeah, that's probably true. Um, uh, race slightly pops its head up. This figure, I'm actually a bit embarrassed I've forgotten his name. This is the only non-white figure I could find in the whole account. A uh, guy who trained over in Leeds um, and came to use the Manchester Mark One on uh, the crystallographic questions. And again, no room for this guy. In the Manchester computing space, he has to go off to he goes off to America uh, on the left, um, uh, and uh, it's a, it's quite a well-trodden route. But this woman is probably not one of the early computer operators or software engineers. Not as you've seen, because there weren't any. In fact, a large number of the early uh, recruits, particularly to Ferranti, but also in the math department, were women. She's probably a model. And if you look, she's knitting in front of the computer. Why is she knitting? It's not because she's not doing a job. The fact that this machine will do your job for you. You give it the problem, you sit back for 17 minutes, and then it pops out the answer. And in between, you take up your gender appropriate leisure activity. So that's why she's knitting. There's another one that's crocheting. Um, uh, and sexuality is there in that history. Of course, Turing, as we'll come to famously, um, a gay man and quite an out one, although probably it should is a rest, probably not to the rest of the department. Um, this is, I mentioned that people start talking about using the computer for love letters. And you may know the story of Christopher Strachey, who was briefly in Manchester, um, uh, a, a somewhat more out gay man. Uh, and there's, it's fascinating that he wrote a, a program to create heterosexual love letters um, by choosing words like desire, wish, liking, love, and longing at random, slotting them in patterns for making uh, writing love letters. Um, uh, my own interest in Turing actually came from his, his work on mathematical biology. My some work patterns on cows. Um, uh, in fact, my first interaction with the Science Museum was. Uh, Almost a decade, a decade ago, we did a big project on growing sunflowers in the Fibonacci files. And Turing worked on those, those mathematical biology problems using his access to the Manchester computer. Uh, he uh, had another boyfriend who was Norwegian. So when he wrote um, a subroutine tree for his program, 
which was he was very keen on Norway. So there was a Nor mast, and there was a, an Ibsen routine, and two of the subroutines are Kjell plus and Kjell minus. That's the name of the boyfriend. So um, th there are all sorts of stories in here. Another story, again, um, uh, I'd love to talk about a bit more is the university started noticing this new thinking machine and started, the philosophers in particular started saying, you know, get off my lawn, we know about that. Uh, and they had a, a, a debate um, in 1950, I forget the year, 1950 odd, uh, to what are they going to do with the new computer machine? 49, I think it was. And in this race, this thing comes out, are mathematicians human beings? Um, and there's another issue there a little bit about thinking about the reception of Turing. Are mathematicians too strange or too interested in the conceptual to help us solve our practical problems? I mean, the idea that Turing's 1936 conceiving of the general purpose computer would rather suggest that actually mathematicians are quite valuable people to have, because there's a straight line from that through to Max Newman's and Turing's own understanding of thinking machines and this desire to have um, smart software. But then, but then, um, this is a picture of Wilmslow Police Station, thanks to the bus aficionados. They're the people who've got the best coverage of 1950s Britain. Um, uh, behind it is now demolished Wilmslow Police Station. And as you'll know, if you've seen the Theory 90 film or read books or whatever, um, for some reason that no one's ever really understood, Alan, Ch well, we know why he walked into the police station, he walked into the police station to report burglary, and during the interview, he disclosed the fact that he'd had what uh, was then illegal sexual activity, entirely consensual sexual activity with uh, a man. Um, the record accounts tend not to mention the fact that that man was 17, uh, and when Turing was 40, or, um, uh, and you could say, why should they? But um, uh, as a consequence of that, as is very well known, he was put on trial. He was publicly shamed as a sex offender. That's the thing that happened to him. And who turns up at his trial? Max Newman turns up. And they say, do you know the, the, the accused? And Max Newman says, I know Alan Turing. Alan Turing is my friend. And the maths department, uh, after he's prosecuted, they uh, renew his contract, right? He, is, he has a job in Manchester. He has a role in Manchester. Or does he have a role? No, 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 because by this stage, he's really not going into the department anymore. First year after his uh, prosecution, rest, he goes on working the last si and writing to academics around the world. The last six months, that really tails off. And there's a story which I think is very convincing that he becomes very depressed about his treatment, about uh, he's part of the dynamic that goes on. He goes to psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis at the time very much says, well, you're broken if you're homosexual. You know, I can treat you. Do you want to be straight? And you think, well, do I want to be straight? And maybe I do. He doesn't. He, he, it's it's an unclear time. Historically. And then, of course, uh, when he's 41 years old, uh, he, and I often get this question, I have no more knowledge than anyone else who talks about this stuff, but I'm convinced that I'm committed suicide. Um, uh, at the age of 41, um, uh, and then the Turing story goes very, very quiet for a long time, for a whole series of reasons. One is his most important national contribution was at Lexi Park, of which no one spoke. One is his most important to contribution to thought was on computable numbers, which is completely incomprehensible paper outside a very small pair of mathematical magicians, who never forget him. You know, Turing is always revered by mathematical magicians. And his impact in Manchester is totally forgotten. He's just not there. And by association, almost, the mathematicians are pushed out of the story too, right? They didn't build any of the machines. Turing was quite hands-on, but there's the intellectual component of what went on uh, was lost to memory. We saw Kilburn just forgot where he picked up the idea of computer from. And yet, in 2000 odd, um, the mass department get a new building and they call it the Turing Building. 
And what's happened in the intervening period? Well, there's a really brilliant biography, and if you can bear not to buy a copy of my book, I don't see how that could work, but then uh, buy a copy of Alan, um, Andrew Hodges' uh, biography um, uh, of Alan Turing. That comes out, that creates a certain stir. There's, there's a, 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 a West End play, the TV play. Um, Bletchley Park, in particular, explodes, really feeds a British national myth of, of you know, plucky bricks using brilliance to solve the problem. And then also during story, of course, feeds very rightly and very naturally into a narrative about how we have in the past treated homosexual men specifically and um, the whole narrative that led eventually to a pardon for men convicted under that law, which is then for greater decency. So he becomes a big figure with a Hollywood film, he becomes a massive international figure. And to record that, of course, you know, the Alan Turing building is named in that way, uh, with a quote saying, those who can imagine anything can create the impossible. Alan Turing did, of course, never say that. Then he did come to that story. But that's a, a different story. And that's a story. Uh, I saw Andrew Hodges, I say that, his biographer, give a talk uh, in 2001, Ford, uh, on the Oxford Road. Uh, and he got a lot of pushback. Uh, aggression, actually, is what I would call it, from the Manchester University Computer Science Department people, who were the guardians of that entirely historically precise account of the engineer's story. It's very small writing. Uh, I'll, I'll read through it. Um, uh, and what Andrew Hodges suggested was, what was the problem? Why wasn't Turing accepted in that uh, computing laboratory. And he talked about binaries, hard and soft, engineering and mathematics, Williams and Kilburn, Newman, Turing, things and concept, north and south, real Manchester, virtual woman Chester, gay, straight, upper middle class, middle class, Cambridge, Manchester. You can multiply the binaries and decide which side of them you're on or which is important as long as you want. And it's quite, it was very important to me this these these distinctions but when i tried to sort of come up with an answer which one is right I, you know, the whole thing dissolved in my hand right we, we can't know why children and during didn't get on and they really didn't um and i think certainly if you looked at the apartment that william and kilburn built and judged it by modern standards you would say it was it really really lost impact because it didn't have diversity And so you might think about a counterfactual, about a world in which Kilburn and Turing had worked more productively together, because they were both really insightful, hardworking, passionate, I think we could say brilliant men. What would have happened? Well, I think what would have happened is software would have happened in Manchester. I mentioned there were two post-war sites of British computing, Manchester and Cambridge. And Manchester, if you saw the Kilburn building, you saw that quote, the Atlas. The Atlas, and I'm going to say this with some trepidation and want to be challenged, the Atlas was a failure. Not technologically, it was very, it was briefly, I think, the fastest machine in the world. But they sold two and a half copies of it. Right? And that wasn't enough to sustain a British fast computer industry. And the result for that was not, of course, with the engineers. Nothing could compete with the American missile defense program that used American military computing to do it. But um, nevertheless, software didn't happen in Manchester. And it did happen in Cambridge, right? Where are the British software, maybe not billion, actually, I think there's one or two billionaires and millionaires. They live in Cambridge and they were early um, uh, workforce for advanced risk machine, ARM, that designs the chip in every phone in the world. So I do wonder if, uh, this is, I don't want to turn it into a diversity awareness talk, but I do wonder if a bit more attention to the different skills and the different um, uh, tools people bring might have had a different story. Okay, so that's time to start. I, I've written a few, a bit more about some of these issues on my blog, which I uh, recommend you uh, try once you're bored of the signs and I'm very delighted to have any comments at my email I'll just take some questions now but mainly 
I have three copies of this, physical copies of this book, uh, which I can, which my glamorous assistant and wife um, is at the book ready to sell uh, uh, for £15, which is cheaper than you can buy it in the shop. Uh, and if you don't have £50 on you, uh, we can come to some arrangement, uh, or you can buy it online. Uh, and I don't care where you buy it from online uh, these days, so um, uh, Amazon or the History Press. Um, uh, and can I take some questions? Before you do that, just to, to, to prompt the people uh, online, if you've got any questions, start typing them now. And when Jonathan has answered any questions in the room, we'll come back to uh, the questions from online. Thanks. I'll, I'll make a few comments, actually, based on, yeah, yeah. Uh, as I said before, and, and a lot of you will know, um, put my video back on again so people can, can see me. Um, I'm one of a few people online who, who do volunteer at the museum with, with baby, and there's a few things you said there that... You, that okay. I'll <laughs> the, the, the 60 people online can hear me beautifully. Um, there's one comment you made about, about soot. I mean, it's, it's very much a, bit, a big deal. I mean, we, we do talk about that baby was, and the Mark one that followed, it was very hot and they had to open the windows um, to let the heat out. And of course, the atmosphere in 1948 was a bit rubbish. Um, Tom Kilburn, apparently, um, I think Chris Burton will back me up on this. When he, when he first saw the replica, he said, it's just like the original, but it's not as filthy because the original would have been absolutely covered in in the black stuff you know and like, yeah and that, that, carried on working i think that's very interesting because it really plays into this business of man's work dirty dirty machine work um but those women audrey bates just before i didn't mention her by name um who were actually running these programs they were the people who were as it were demonstrating value on the machine they were having to use these machines in the same sweltering conditions they're running upstairs and downstairs um they were doing um, uh, a bit grand for emotional labor. That's what it was. They were work they they had to keep the engineers um, on their side to keep the machine running so they could deliver their uh, program. Um, and that was a very physical thing. And the differential analyzer is interesting because again, that was that was an oil and grease driven machine. That's the move, that's the mechanic. So, so you're wearing a white coat. Um, but the best operator of it. Uh, was a woman, um, and again, there are memories of those things, those things and that people remember the woman. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, the and I, I, I kind of skated over this because it's um, it's a bit uh, subject of academic debate, well, not really debate, but that um, the new job which we would now call programmer, perhaps even sales programmer that Ferranti effectively created at, at Moston. It was really natural to recruit women to do, to do that job uh, because it had been women who'd done, who'd run desk calculators, who'd run the, the numerical, you know, they'd done what Douglas Archer had told them to do to do the calculations in the world. So it's really natural to have women in that role. Um, and it's not until the 1960s and 70s that women get pushed out of software and computers. Um, and there are arguments about whether that's to do with professionalization. And there are arguments about whether that, what's lost with that. And there are academics who argue that actually Britain lost its lead by losing its women. I, I, I can't really evaluate at that point. But yeah, the dirt is really there. And, and the pride in the dirt and the self definition in the dirt is really interesting, I think. We've got a question uh, online about, he said, how was Turing's biological, I um, mean, sunflower and animal skin pattern contributions, remember? That's Anderson, I did that in Manchester, and you talked about it to me before we started a little bit, didn't you? About looking back at the, some of the software that he was doing. was a question. About, about the, uh, his biological research that he was doing on the Mark 1. And what was he doing? About sunflowers or the... Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm glad. Yeah. Uh, who asked that question? No. Dave Gilbert. Yeah, thank you very much, Dave. That's the question I'd like to ask. Um, so, uh, Alan Turing got engaged when he was at Letcher Park um, to a woman who went on, who actually was close to one of our top code breakers. Uh, and she remembered um, uh, lying on the grass with him talking about Fibonacci patterns in days. I don't know what they are, you don't know, but um, there's this really odd appearance of mathematics in, in natural form. And Turing, like lots of 
people like Max Hume were really intrigued by this from a sort of pure mathematical perspective. You know, not 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 really what's the mechanism that makes it, but how how come there's this general approval appearance of these numbers? And we don't know why he came up with the idea, or I don't know why he came up with the idea, but in 1952, so exactly during this period where he's working very closely with the Manchester computer, he published a paper using results done on the Manchester computer um, uh, that is absolutely the founding paper of my of what became my field you know, as an academic mathematical biology, where he developed a thing called the Turing instability, which is a way of generating pattern when you didn't have pattern before. So the natural way you might imagine, and probably is the way that, say, cows get their black and white blotches. Um, but he had grand plans for that, and uh, he thought he could use this mechanism he'd, he'd thought about, discovered, you might say, uh, to explain where these Fibonacci patterns came from. Um, and that's what he used his sessions on the computer for. And I find that really fascinating because he's 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 one of the very few people in the world who knows the value of this resource. It, you know, he has to be there at midnight till 6 a.m. or whatever, whatever it is. Uh, and he doesn't use this access. He doesn't use it. He, he's not been asked to design atom bombs or um, uh, lenses or anything like that. But he doesn't use it to think about cryptography. He doesn't use it to think about um, foundations of computer science. He uses it to think about this mathematical biology problem. And there are um, traces recorded of that in the program sheets that he left both uh, in the John Ryland Library and University, and there's another tranche down in Cambridge. Um, and uh, it's a good open question say, to take his programs and run them on a uh, mark on simulator, because I, he's probably using them in that period. Of so that, that was kind of my route into this, because I, I sort of. Uh, and that's, that's what he was he, he actually, I should say, he actually came up with the right answer. Very happy to do I have a good Is there any questions in the room? Back then. Uh, there, there was, yeah, so the question was whether at that early period, 1940s, into the 50s, there's a, a sense of existential doom from computing. And I don't think there is at all because uh, the only people who can see the possibilities are very techno optimistic. They think, obviously, it's going to be brilliant when we've got artificial intelligence. Um, and the one uh, downside of that is the, oh, I didn't show you the, the, the quote with, where Lynn talked about it. Uh, is she's one of the few people because um, I mean, she was a very bright woman, very good writer, but she was kind of just a professor's wife by that stage. She was making the tea, and, um, uh, and so she overhears these conversations, and she's the person who who hears red flags. But you know, we just have those in, in letters to her friends. It doesn't create a um, uh, a backlash. Um, uh, I mean, the, the, the connection, of course, where the backlash is coming, I think uh, this is just squeezing a bit about Patrick Blackett. Patrick Blackett, although he was a very patrician establishment figure, was also very left wing. And he um, was increasingly, certainly, he was very anti atomic weapons or the states developing atomic weapons. And he thought that Britain shouldn't have the bomb, there should be some kind of international agreement. And Winston Churchill really distrusted him, and he was on the list of pinko scientists. And so it's quite amusing that the Royal Navy have just named their new scientific research vessel after him. Um, and 
Blackett and Newman were very disappointed, and again, this is anecdotal rather than documentary, when the Manchester computer shifted to this business of doing fast numerical computation, which is what Williams and Kilburn could see there was a demand for, right, and a technical problem to solve to deliver. And so that machine became increasingly used for, you know, they sold copies to, to the nuclear engineering establishment, the sold one for GCHQ eventually. Um, uh, so it lost, the Manchester computer lost that uh, concentration on thinking research. Um, perhaps, perhaps good, you know. Um, Me a lot in the room? I've got a, um, comments online. <laughs> from Tim, who's one of my fellow fellow volunteers. It's not a very helpful comment, but he says the replica is about to be cleaned by two ladies, which is very much saying how things have become rather sexist in the time. But um, if I can find it, there's a comment from um, Dave Holdsworth, who from the CCS specialises in software. He said women were pushed out of schools by Zappau games on BBC Micros. Um, at least we had 40% women in the late 60s intake for computer degrees. Yeah, uh, as I say, I, you know, that's a big um, sociological question that, uh, rightly speaking, historians of technology are spending a lot of time thinking about, and I, I wouldn't claim to answer. Um, uh, but I, it, it was, you know, interesting to me that it was surprising to me that there were so many women in early computing. Um, and uh, it was a good career for young women uh, in the central ref. They've, they've still got a, a, a book of career options for girls and you know it's got down you know become a, a desk calculator operator and they claimed you could earn two thousand pounds a year which is what a lecturer was earning I don't know if it's true but um, it was like published by a desk calculator company but um uh, I, I might have got this wrong but I, I I've got a feeling I've heard that some of the ladies like Sicily Popperwell etc uh, almost went on strike to get equal pay with the men. In there's, a, there's, conflict, there's two conf completely conflicting stories about that. One of which is that Cecily Popperwell um, had a strong, well, yeah, but let's, let's use that gender language with the branch manager and got equal pay. And the other is that nothing happened and they didn't. So I don't know whether we could do it. It's an interesting um, thing. The, the, Ferran the Ferranti archives. Uh, are in the science museum, the museum of science industry. Um, and I don't know if they would have that. I mean, it's a fascinating insight into, uh, you know, the radio belt where you have female assembly women supervised by male, men, male engineers in white coats. Jim Miles, who, who you know, has commented yeah. as well about um, when he said about the Turing building, he, he commented on that bit earlier. Um, but he's also said that uh, some of the details about his biological structures and the calculations are now on some of the big yeah, display absolutely. screens. And so uh, the, the, the university, university now. has done a very good job in some ways of um, telling the Turing story. Uh, and it, I don't think Jim would be offended if I said it's been pushed into that by Turing's global fame. So, uh, I think it, you'd have to say belatedly, after Turing's become famous, the university started to use that story and um, the computer science department, I, I think it would be fair to say quite late into that um, activity, but the university history thing. So if you walk around uh, the university campus, even as a visitor, there are little placards up. And, and now, uh, outside that building with the two blue plaques, uh, there is a, a sort of information, what are they called, totem? information stand and it tells both of the stories on the same information stand. I think that's um James Fox's place the University of Sierra Network. But it doesn't connect them. Right? They're, they're still literally they're now side by side on the same stand, but there's still no uh, crossover between them. Um, and you know you may say that's like rigorous history, but the fact is people come to Manchester and they think, oh we invented the computer, oh Turing and that's the story they go away with. Um, and, you know, perhaps that's the plan. Stop sharing that screen. Well, I'm quite happy to keep showing the pictures. That's a bit better. Um, I don't think I've got any more specific questions online. Comments about, uh, yeah, again from Tim. Very complimentary about the well, I said it sold two and a half copies. 
and I said it was a technologically brilliant machine. So is that praise or not? Mm. So I, I, I salute you, right? I mean, I, uh, that was clearly uh, a brilliant technical, British techni te technical achievement of a team. And the question is, why didn't you get rewarded for that with a, 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 a British computer industry worthy of the name? Um, and it wasn't because you weren't good enough at your job, I don't think. Uh, so for, where, point, for those of you online, the, the, the point was yeah. from, from somebody who worked on the Atlas, yeah. a comment about Jonathan's comment about it not being very successful because from our point of view and for people who worked in for Anti at the time, it was a marvelous machine. It was a, yeah, it, it was a brutal machine, very successful uh, as a piece of hardware, but it didn't, it didn't spark the software, it didn't spark at the time. You know, people couldn't use it in the way that it might've been much more useful. Uh, well, I mean, what's your what's your thought? What, how do you... And then I think the government said, "No, Harwell, you're going to buy IBM." Or did Harwell say you're going to buy IBM? Um, you know, that wasn't because you were bad at your job. Perhaps we should try soon the government push for an American purchase. It would have been the Treasury because they had. Yeah. Uh, the, I just wonder, on your influence somewhere, it's very difficult to tell this range. Well, one of the, I, I will just, that does remind me, one of the things I discovered during the research of this book is um, that Ferranti paid Williams and Kilburn and Alan Turing really substantial uh, consultancy fees over the four or five years of development for Mark 1. Uh, uh, and then separately. So so the, the, they, they did quite well out of the deal, as did Ferranti. Um, uh, yeah. No, so I, I, I'm sorry, I, w I wasn't in any way suggesting that Atlas was a technical failure. Um, but uh, it's, it, you know, there's a boundary between engineering and delivering a, a market product and it's hard to know whether that applies when you're talking about these big items of national scientific pension structure what kind of game do they i've got some more of a comment yeah. than a, than a question here from phil hodges is one of the things i'm always interested in is how the work on computing devices were kept secret in the uk post-war and he's gone with a quote and whatever, but I, I, I guess it's much, much bigger deal than the Alan Turing, wasn't it? Uh, how work, how the Bletchley work was kept secret, or just in general? Uh, probably in general. He does say the work on computing devices. So I think uh, so. Simon Lavington, uh, who I should just credit in general because he's done a lot of the research and written a lot of the uh, documentary evidence behind this talk. Although I think he disagrees with quite a lot of my conclusion. Uh, he's done a lot of work on, in particular, um, how GCHQ used computing um, and obviously they were very concerned to do things secretly um, it, it, I mean if the question is specifically about Bletchley Park technology that's that's a a curious story about why it came out when it did or actually why the I, I have heard I don't know if this is true that one of the major reasons for operation security not wanting to talk about Bletchley Park for decades after was that the British government's confiscated all the German Enigma machines and then sold them to Commonwealth countries for secure communication in the knowledge that they could read that secure communication between um, newly independent countries. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Um, uh, well, I, I mean, a, a, a question is whether that cost us, whether that secrecy cost us. You know, we know that uh, since the GCHQ came up with uh, RSA encryption, before RNSNA came up with it. Um, uh, does that matter? You know, did we lose out by keeping the inside defense establishments? I suspect that's a bit un unknowable. It's off right? my, it's it's off my uh, um, uh, I don't know. Okay, right. I think it's uh, <laughs> becoming time to, to wrap up. Um, for those people in the room, as uh, Jonathan said, there are copies of his book for sale. 
uh, for those people who aren't in the room, I'm sure you could find out where to buy his book. Your your version, if you buy one, would be slightly website, less, point you straight to it, slightly less right. thumbed than my copy, which is uh, getting rather worn out now, I'm afraid. But very interesting book. There's lots of stuff, lots of questions I know I've had during this talk. That I'm going to have to go back and read the book because most of them, I think you've probably answered in the book. So um, on behalf of those of you online and uh, the people in the room, I always say thank you very much to Jonathan for the for the talk. Thank you very thank much. You. I, I, I do just quickly want to come back to this Atlas thing, or not really Atlas specifically, but I, 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 when I wrote the book, when I originally wrote the book, I didn't want to write about history of computing at all, part of it's you know, covered by a lot of experts. Um, but one of the things that really intrigued me was, and I mentioned this during the talk, was when you look at particularly how they're marketing, we didn't talk about Vivian Bowden, who was a really interesting Manchester figure, who sold these machines. Um, they were sold to boards and forward thinking uh, people in business and in industry and in defense as you know the new thing. For the same reason that many people took careers in these industries, the new kind of thing. You've got to be happy to have one of these in order to do your be more efficient, save money, etc. And because there was this constant cycle of innovation. There was never a point, I don't think, when anyone sat down and said, has this actually saved us money? You know, Lion's Tea Shop very famously computerized their uh, business processes in the 1950s, something like that, with the Leo. Um, no one's ever actually sat down and said, in hindsight, would it have been cheaper to actually have a counter? You know, uh, uh, and I think it probably would have been, because even if she's a bit early, before the 1960s, these machines were always breaking down. The software was unusable, right? Full of bugs. It's really hard to work. Um, uh, and I, I think there is a kind of historical lesson about how expensive new technology gets um, cured. Uh, and it's it's never really on proven delivery against engineering uh, schedule. So I'd be curious. For those people who are thinking about reconstructing computing and encounter, you know, old computers and encounter the problems of getting it running, you were telling me about the problems that they, um, uh, about, you know, how reliable these machines were, it, just in hardware terms, actually. Uh, uh, and I mean, some people, uh, was it, I can't remember who it was, said, you know, you can't have a, Computer because you need so many valves that always keep breaking. So that was, yeah. Um, so, uh, and sorry, I'm grasping for an angle. So, um, there's a story of, I think, Cicely Popperwell. He was asked to write a routine to invert a matrix, and it came by 10 matrix. And that was the thing that the customer wanted that would show or show that it was. So she wrote this routine. Using her mathematical skills, her knowledge of a computer, she went to put it on the Mark One. She ran it, and uh, or, or the Manchester Mark One, I think. Um, and uh, then the valve blew, and it broke. So she had to start again next night, and she did it again and again and again. And the machine wasn't reliable enough for a runtime long enough to invert a ten by ten matrix. So she goes to Tom Kilburn and says, "Look, it's not. It doesn't work. Your machine doesn't work." And he said, my machine does work, your code's too slow. And he was very dismissive of it. And she remembered that snub 40 years later. She remembered being dismissed. She remembered, at, at, I think, the 50th anniversary celebration, but maybe a bit earlier, uh, going up to Tom Kilburn and him saying, yeah, you were right, really. And she appeared to forgive him. I don't know how it was. But, um, but, so I think it's a very interesting reliability. Uh, it's a really interesting question that I, I think people with reconstructing computers could really help um, comment. Yeah, great. Right.